in what ways does discuss discussed impact our moral judgment of others? How does it flavor moral judgment? Yeah. And, you know, the debate about what social versus uh, non-social discussed um, kind of came about because of uh, the work on moral disgust. Um, but here's so here's one thing that I think is is just true. So because disgust, that low level grossness is associationist and because it's such strong avoidance motivation, it gives such strong avoidance motivation. If I can make, say, you seem disgusting, then other people might avoid you. So because of that, rhetorically, I think it's a, it turns out to be a powerful emotion used in a social sense, but but um, not a social emotion per se. So I say, um, and this is this is rhetoric that's been used, you know, for a long, long time. If you describe people in ways that makes them seem physically disgusting, it's a bit easier to mistreat them. And so women, uh, Jews, gay people, gay men specifically, have often been described by like people who want you to not care for those people um, as disgusting in a bodily way. Right? So, so uh, I always forget where I read this, but an er like I read an early sort of description of women by like a monk who was trying to persuade other monks that they should be chaste, and he just started talking about the the bodily fluids that emerge from a woman, right? Trying to get them to be grossed out, presumably in order to avoid to avoid them. But you look at the language to this day of. Uh, anti-homosexual rhetoric is often in very specific terms trying to describe certain sexual acts that that might be disgusting. Um, and so the strength with which we can elicit disgust in people, I think, can le it lends itself very easily to trying to, to I don't want to use the term dehumanize. I think that's used too often, but it's a very easy way to get me to at the very least, ignore you and not care about you, like um, avoid you if I make you seem disgusting. To which I always say, you know, uh, especially with the gay men thing where where a lot of rhetoric is around sexual acts that you're supposed to find disgusting, I would say, you know, most sex sexual acts are pretty disgusting unless you're intimately involved in them. So you could pretty much describe the sexual acts of anybody and I might be grossed out. Whether or not that has any say uh, uh, about my moral beliefs, I think it's a completely different question. It probably shouldn't, but yeah. It um, also probably yeah. has to do with how attractive you judge the people to be. Well, there are these really cool studies showing that, um, as you might imagine, we have str strong, I've already mentioned the strong disgust that we can have for bodily fluids of other people because those tend to be the, if there is a disease to be carried, you're going to get it in that way. So s somebody sneezing or somebody bleeding or, so, you know. Um, but that's a problem if you also need, for the sake of reproduction, if evolution needs people to intimately exchange bodily fluids. And so what you get, what you, people who have done these studies is they show that if you get somebody sexually aroused first, uh, their disgust response in general dampens. So uh, so sexual arousal kind of kills disgust um, temporarily. But the, uh, the opposite is also true. Getting someone disgusted first makes it harder to get them sexually aroused, which also makes sense. So there is a delicate balance there between the bodies of others that we want to avoid and the bodies of others we want to get closer to. Yeah. Did did you wa are, are you familiar with I mean obviously you know the name Jeff Dahmer but did you watch the the, the Netflix yeah no I can't so you know I'll re reveal something here I am actually really easily disgusted and and qu quite queasy when it comes to those things like 
I, I don't even have a stomach for true crime. Like my, my wife loves true crime stuff and I've tried to watch documentaries about it. And I just, I'm like, how can you, how can you watch this? Yeah, I just can't. But yeah, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I know the things that Dahmer did. Oh, well, I, I don't know if you know what I'm referring to explicitly uh, because I have no idea if it's based in fact. So if it's not, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't know this. But there's a scene in which he's talking to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist tells him something to the effect that there is some hypothesis that shiny or glistening objects are attractive to men because this effect has been evolutionarily endowed in them so that when they see uh, a woman who is aroused, they recognize the wetness on her vagina as indicative of sexual oh interest. Yeah, and this, psych this psychiatrist says that his like violence and blood sort of fetish might in some way be a product of this attraction to women's wetness. Yeah. And I have no idea if this is real, but it's, it is related to what we were just talking about. That is hilarious. I've never heard that hypothesis. Um, and evolutionary psychology sometimes gets into uh, these kinds of explanations that I'm like, really, really, buddy. So, but I, you know, I remain agnostic. Like maybe there's evidence for this. But my first thought is, that's a pretty hidden thing. It's not very easy to spot. Like I spot a coin from the street. <laughs> It'd be amazing if it were that easy to spot. <laughs> yeah, especially in all those dark huts and caves. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> yeah. People would have had very uh, different, must have had, for that to that hypothesis to work, people would have had to have had very different sexual practices for a very, very long period of time. Of, oftentimes when I'm, I'm reading uh, some of the evolutionary psychology literature that is about the sexual stuff, I I have to really remind myself like what does this say about the what would what would have been necessary for this to actually evolve through natural selection and it's usually something quite implausible